OK, I'm going to embrace the national stereotype and say it's going to be difficult for me to, uh, as a Welshman, to keep my comments to seven minutes, but I'm going to do my best. Um, there's an agreement that um, the result of this referendum, yes or no, matters hugely to the rest of the UK. That's kind of common ground. However, and, you know, and, and, it, uh, and it's an interesting paradox, that despite it apparently mattering to the rest of us, the conduct of the No campaign has been largely left to Scottish unionists, uh, as, as my colleague was pointing out. Um, it's essentially been devolved to the Scottish franchises of the unionist parties. Now, it's true that there are elements within the UK government actively involved, so there are people busy in the Cabinet Office, people busy in the Treasury, you know, hence things like the Let's Stay Together campaign. But to a very, very considerable extent, the campaign for the con continuation of the union is being driven and directed by Scottish unionists. Not only that, but the No campaign and certainly the, the specific pledges entered into in the course of that campaign have focused on what's in the best interests of Scotland, what's good for the Scottish Union, the relationship between Scotland and the UK is somehow assumed to be good for the rest of us. The views of politicians, let alone the general public in the rest of the UK, don't seem to matter very much. Now, in what follows, I just want to focus on the consequences of this. And what I want to contend is that the uh, pledges that have been entered into in terms of what follows from a no vote, whilst clearly beneficial to Scotland and, dare I say, to Scottish unionist politicians, are directly de detrimental to the interests of another poorer part of the union, that is Wales. Not only that, but during the course of the long campaign, Scottish unionists have been allowed to torpedo the best chance of finding a solution to some of the tensions that threaten at some point to undermine English confidence in the union. The result of that, I argue, is that while Scottish unionists might be successful in the short term on the 18th of September, this victory may come at a substantial price in terms of storing up problems for the future. So let me start uh, with Wales and then say a little bit, if I'm forgiven, about England. The economic fortunes of Scotland and Wales are very, very different. Scotland is relatively prosperous, economically successful, while Wales is anything but. So the latest GVA figures, Scotland is 94% of the UK average, of course, an average which is hugely distorted by the southeast of England. Wales is 72% of the UK average. Despite these differences, the levels of public spending, devolved public spending in both nations, are directly linked via our old friend, the Barnett Formula. A formula that gives Scotland, more prosperous Scotland, higher per capita public spending than Wales. Again, those are the most recent figures. Uh, now, in 2009, the Holtham Commission calculated that a devolved services in Wales and Scotland were funded on the same basis as English regions, okay? Wales would be 300 million better off a year. Scotland would be about 4 billion per year down, okay? If Wales were funded on the same basis as Scotland last year, we would have been £1.4 billion pounds better off, which is around a tenth of the budget of the Welsh Government. That is a lot of money for a small country. Now, unsurprisingly, therefore, Welsh politicians are all very keen to see the reform of the Barnet formula. Um, and indeed, Labour in Wales are making it a precondition for uh, income tax devolution for Wales, something they claim to want. It's not only Welsh politicians that uh, uh, see Barnet as unjust and indefensible, albeit reluctantly, until recently, we saw Scottish unionists moving gradually towards accepting the case for Barnet for reform. So in Calman, you find, which is of course Labour instigated but all unionists, there's a sentence in there accepting the case for a Barnet review. In the current coalition, agreement between the Conservatives and Liberal Democrats, the case for Barnet reform is accepted, albeit kicked into the long grass. Um, what's happened, however, during the course of the campaign is that all of the unionist parties have said either explicitly or let it be known that Barnet will be kept. 
Barnet will remain. Okay? Um, at no point does anybody seem to have considered what this means for Wales. Okay? At no point uh, has keeping Scotland's Barnet bonus been set against the damage that this causes for Welsh interests. Or if anybody has considered it, we are considered collateral damage. Maybe we really are too poor, too wee and too stupid to matter much. But in a context where some of the rhetoric in favour of the union is about a sharing union, a social solidarity, uh, I, I'm having trouble computing that particular one. Okay, if I can move quickly to England. Um, as we've heard already, people in England want to keep the union. There's no doubt at all about that. But it's not to say that they are happy with the union as currently constituted. English opinion, this is data from the Future of England survey in 2012. We'll have some more data out in the next few days, which I think will make some very interesting reading. English opinion is affronted by one of the consequences of asymmetric devolution, namely that following devolution, non-English MPs can vote on issues, a vote on laws that apply in England only. They are affronted by that. The fact that this so rarely happens in practice, you know, that the West Lord in question so rarely implies in practice, really does stand, I think, as a stark warning as to what might occur if there's ever a Labour government, uh, UK government, with a relatively small majority, say after May 2015. I don't think it's alarmist to say that if we have a UK government seeking to govern England without a stable English majority, there will be a legit legit real legit legitimacy crisis. And yet, the subtle and sensible proposals of the Mackay Commission that sought to address what they termed the English question have been scuppered. Scuppered if press reports are to be believed by Scottish unionist politicians. Indeed, the meeting of the Liberal Democrats Parliamentary Party at which Scottish Liberal Democrat MPs lined up to condemn Mackay was reportedly the most fractious since the coalition was formed in May 2010. Given the hammerings that party has received in various elections uh, in the interim, that really is saying something. Scottish Labour MPs were also instrumental in ensuring that their party has recommended the Mackay proposals. Instead, what we're getting increasingly is talk about regionalising England, okay? Uh, which you know, I view as entirely disingenuous. I mean, there are good arguments for decentralising within England, but dealing with the asymmetries of devolution ain't one of them, because nobody is talking about devolving legislative powers to city regions and county regions within England. Okay? So the basic problem of Westminster being a dual legislature for the UK and England is not touched by English regionalism, and yet we're supposed to maintain the pretense until the 18th of, of September that this is somehow addressing England, English concerns about the asymmetries of devolution. Finally, um, it's also the other major English grievance is of course the widespread perception that Scotland is somehow feather bedded. Um, as I've already said, any moves towards reforming Barnet have been shelved indefinitely. So therefore, uh, so long as Scottish demographics mute the convergence effects of, of Barnet, which I won't go into now, public spending per capita will remain much higher in Scotland than in England. Um, now, from a Welsh perspective, obviously it's time to ditch Barnet. If the UK government wants to continue uh, funding Scotland's preferential treatment, then so be it. But why should Wales have to suffer the consequences? There's even a justification to hand. Scotland puts in more net into the union than it takes out. So, you know, why not explain to the English taxpayers that actually this is the price of union? It's the Scottish equivalent of Thatcher's European rebates, okay? Um, um, the reason why I suppose this doesn't happen is that this would make life uncomfortable for Scottish unionists. And as we've seen for the past few weeks and months, it's Scottish unionists who get the call, the shots, about what kind of union the rest of us live in, for the moment at least. Thank you. Thank you.